Good afternoon. I know that many of us are uh, sleepy and tired and waking up after that fantastic uh, meal. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Southwestern. That, that was some good food. It reminds me of the Tuesdays at Circle K. How many of y'all remember Circle K? All right. Uh, we are coming into uh, another portion of the topic of the restoration uh, history and movement. And for those of you who were here earlier uh, to hear uh, the impressive uh, presentations by Dr. Edward Robertson and also Terry Gardner, um, these were some fantastic um, histories of our tradition. Can we just give another round of applause um, for what we witnessed? And we also ask you to take notes and to write down your questions. One of the things that I learned as a student at Southwestern about education is that learning comes through questioning, not assuming that we already know. But sitting in Dr. Maxwell's class and also um, Dr. Foster's class, we asked questions and that's how we grew. So we want to ask those questions. We have a very capable panel. Do y'all see this panel to my left? It's we have some incredible scholars and thinkers and also um, thinkers who have been a part of this tradition in very significant ways. I'm gonna call their names and also uh, brief um, titles, but afterwards I'm gonna ask for them to take um, less than two minutes just to introduce themselves and their context, and then we'll get deeper into this conversation. Uh, we have Dr. Edward Robinson, who is a professor of history and religion at Texas College. He's also the senior minister at North Tenahall uh, Church of Christ. Can we give him a round of applause for being here with us today? We have uh, the vice president of student affairs, also professor. I took my first college Bible class with him, and that's uh, Professor Ben Foster, who's also the minister of the East Side Church of Christ. Amen. We have Dr. Dwayne Winrow, uh, who is a very historical figure. He actually was a student at NCI, Nashville Christian Institute, so he carries that history with him. He was the speaker for Founders Day this year, and he is an incredible scholar. Um, he earned his PhD at USC, and he was one of the uh, professors that I followed after at Pepperdine. He was a professor at Pepperdine. He's the senior minister at Reseda Church of Christ, and we're so glad to have him. Can we give a round of applause for him? And then we have uh, Dr. Orpheus Hayward uh, with us. He is the senior minister at the Renaissance Church of Christ, and he's also a professor at Lipscomb University, very dynamic um, speaker and also thoughtful leader, and we're just so glad to welcome him to this conversation. So can we give a round of applause for him? We got some ooze in there, all right. And then uh, Terry Gardner, Terry Gardner, who is interestingly an attorney, uh, but it's his passion uh, for history, and he did major in history as an undergraduate. I met him again at um, Abilene Christian University because he does a lot of work with the Restoration Center there. He gave an excellent presentation this morning, so can we welcome uh, Terry all the way from Indiana um, this morning. So I know I gave my introductions, but I want just um, each panelist, if you would just briefly uh, just say a little bit more about uh, where you come from and how you come to this conversation you know, in a, two minutes or less. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Talbert, for the very kind introduction and as well as for the invitation to be a part of this uh, panel discussion. And uh, recognizing, of course, uh, Dr. Seamster, esteemed president of Southwestern Christian College, we were classmates together and grateful for what God uh, has done and is doing uh, with him and in him and through him. Uh, by the way, the Texas State Lectureship in 2024, all roads will lead to the North Tenahaw Church of Christ. I know that announcement will be made this evening, but I just want to put it out there uh, 21st through the 24th of January. Uh, I come um, here today by uh, God's grace, having uh, grown up in the Church of Christ in East Texas, Jacksonville, Texas, the church that I grew up in, the Border Street Church of Christ, now the Seminary Heights Church of Christ was planted by Luke Miller. Luke Miller was taught and baptized by Marshall Keeble. And I'm a proud graduate of Southwestern Christian College, so I'm connected to this story in a couple of ways uh, through the Keeble tradition and that um, the church I grew up in was established by one of his 
preaching sons. And then, of course, I'm a um, spiritual descendant of G.P. Bowser. And for that, I'm very thankful. My name is Ben Foster. I feel tremendously honored today to be on this panel and all these great men. And guess what? I think I've told just about all of them. <laughs> so that gives me a special uh, great feeling today. Uh, I've been, uh, since Dr. Seams has brought me back, uh, 52 years altogether. And, uh, my children grew up on this campus. We, they lived in a mobile home for several years as they grew up, and we were sacrificing trying to help build this school. Amen. So I'm mighty, mighty glad to be here today. My name is Winrow, <laughs> and uh, I want to make the, the announcement uh, that he made in March of in March of 2024, 18th through the 21st, all roads lead to the receipt of our Church of Christ. All roads lead to the receipt of Boulevard Church of Christ. We're hosting a, a training and development conference. We will be training preachers, we'll be training youth ministers, we're encouraging churches, you know, beyond this pandemic to establish youth ministry and give an emphasis toward the youth and this type of thing. And so you'll be hearing more about that. Uh, but I, I bring to this, uh, this conversation more of a biblical and theological perspective on the restoration motif. I did my dissertation actually on the restoration motif in terms of why we don't have a social ethic. Um, so I want to somewhat argue, you know, that the restoration motif is not more or less a cultural phenomena as it is a kingdom impulse that's perennial uh, in every, in every, in every period of history, you're going to find that impulse. I contend when you talk about the roots of our movement, it really doesn't start with Campbell. It really started at a, as an intellectual tradition of the humanist, uh, of the Renaissance. Uh, and then that flowed, that, that idea of rediscovering, rediscovering ancient manuscripts that was first an intellectual uh, tradition that infiltrated the religious world uh, and influenced the backside of the Reformation movement. You know, the Reformation, you may not recognize it was still an restoration impulse but um, about the mid part of the 16th century when it was established that the Catholic Church was not going to reform, you know, then you had a more truer manifestation of the Reformation in what is called the Reformed Church tradition. Now keep in mind the emphasis in the Reformed Church tradition was not reforming the Catholic Church, but reestablishing the first century church. In other words, it was a restoration tradition and so when you really talk about uh, Campbell and those guys, they were really more or less protégés of John Calvin. They didn't, they, they didn't buy into Calvinism as we may know it, but still the cultural idea and the theological impulse, the kingdom impulse, you know, that impacted those individuals uh, really came from the Reformed Church idea that dates back to the Renaissance idea you know, of trying to rediscover what the ancients actually believe. Now, is my argument, you know, that the restoration vision is not a primitive vision. Whenever you hear the word primitive is literally a pejorative way of describing the restoration movement uh, as primitivism. And it's those same, it's those same prognosticators that would refer to uh, members of the church as Campbellites. You know, and I, I, I don't tend, and I know that when you talk about primitivism, there's a tendency to be art historical, you know, as though history doesn't have any bearing, you know, upon what we are and who we are and how we do what we do. You know, that's not my argument. My argument is basically that the restoration motif is not a 
primitive vision is a prophetic vision. Dr. And prophetic Wimbo, simply means. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, we're going to get back into this conversation. We just want to introduce, and then we're going to come back through. I'm, I'm on fire. He's on fire, right? So um, we're going to continue with introductions and then come back to you. <laughs> I am Morpheus J. Hayward, and I'm, I don't know why I'm up here <laughs> other than Dr. Seamster asked me to be here, and out of respect for his vision and presidency, um, I've decided to agree to that because I appreciate the direction in which he's going. And if nothing else, I'm probably the catalyst for the reason we're having this discussion. <laughs> and so I will allow you men to do what you're doing because I'm probably the reason this is all taking place. <laughs> so far, they're telling the truth and I appreciate that. I think, I think some, pe some, some people are difficult to follow, so I, I don't know what I can say after that. Uh, already introduced to you, I know uh, this morning, uh, grew up in Northern California. My father was a Church of Christ preacher. Uh, the family was originally from Northwest Arkansas. My grandfather was a lead zinc miner. He died of tuberculosis at age 41 after infecting my grandmother, who died at 37, and after infecting his two daughters, who were both dead before they were 30. So life was hard, and when I'm having a bad day, I say, you know what, at least I'm not a lead zinc miner. <laughs> we want to thank our uh, panelists, uh, as you can see, uh, very capable. This session uh, seeks to understand Churches of Christ in relation to the restoration movement as a response to what we heard earlier in our first session. How might we uh, churches of Christ maintain unity in light of its restoration history. So this session will be a roundtable of scholars and individuals who have deep engagements and commitments to the restoration movement and the churches of Christ. The way we would like to begin in any order, we're going to ask each of our panelists to take about five minutes or less to discuss what is the restoration movement. I first heard of that term in Dr. Maxwell's class here at Southwestern. Uh, many of us are coming uh, to this conversation, maybe we've heard the term before, or we have not. So we're gonna ask our experts, from your perspective and your discipline, what is the restoration movement, and what is, are its implications and significance for the churches of Christ today? So any of our panelists can begin at this time. Well, you know, I see the restoration as a process of uh, trying to get back to uh, that question about <clears throat> from heaven or from man. And we're trying to get back from the voice of God to the voice of God uh, through the apostles as we stay with the apostles' doctrine. Now, my good friend, Dr. Maxwell, <clears throat> has a great book, and he entitled it, uh, Let's Go Back, Way Back. But in my spirit, I would say, you know, back to the Bible I go. And uh, that's what we're trying to do, is get back to the Bible and don't be uh, ship uh and trying to compromise. That's the key word, I think, that, um, you know, between the two positions, uh, God has already stated the position. And that's what we need to do now. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. And it involves the commandment that God gave through Samuel, who incidentally was uh, the last judge of Israel, not mentioned in the book of Judges, <clears throat> and also uh, he served priestly, but he was not an official priest. But he served priestly, but he was also a prophet. And uh, God, 
had him to tell Saul to go down and to utterly destroy the Amalekites. All right, God had swore on his holiness 450 years before that command in uh, Exodus chapter 17 uh, when he said he was Jehovah Nisi, uh, that is God is our banner and he swore from generations to generations that uh, he would uh, more or less uh, uh, annihilate, the time was coming in which, in which he would annihilate the Amalekites because they didn't show kindness when God's people were coming out through Egypt uh, and, and in the wilderness. And so that lets me know <clears throat> that God means what he says. He's told him to go down very specifically and utterly destroy uh, all of the in, uh, individuals and the animals. And it was a clear command, but he disobeyed and brought the king back and the best of the animals and sheep and said, and in that whole process, he got the big head and didn't want to do what God said. Now this is what we got to look at. And he compromised and said that he thought he would bring it back uh, for the sacrifice. But then uh, in the background, uh, the blading of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen gave him away and he knew he was in trouble. And Samuel said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. And we know he lost his kingship. He wanted to walk with Samuel and he reached over and, and uh, tore the garment of the priests, but uh, the man that served priest led. But uh, in the meantime, he said, now God is gonna tear you away from the kingship because you didn't do what God said. Now, the axis on which all of this revolves is the fact that we must give God the honor and obey him rather than man. But this man caved in to the pressure of the people and he changed God's order and the agenda God gave him, he tried to come up with his own agenda. And that is what God disapproved. Now, I'm going to hold it right there. I would like to. <clears throat> right. My understanding of, you know, what is the restoration movement, it represents an attempt to restore, to restore New Testament Christianity in the modern world. I believe that's what. Uh, Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, Ward W. Stone, Walter Scott were attempting to do. But as Dr. Renro correctly pointed out, there were antecedents long before the Campbells arrived. In fact, I would even go back even b before the Renaissance. In many ways, there were those who were trying to restore New Testament Christianity, but the fellowship that you and I are a part of today, we are, we stand in that lineage, that spiritual, biblical, theological lineage of trying to restore New Testament Christianity. That is the church structure in terms of government, plurality of elders, plurality of deacons, and so forth, uh, the evangelist and his um, place, uh, worship, and let's, you know, for example, uh, observing the Lord's Supper, you know, our, our, our understanding of Acts 20 and 1 Corinthians 11 and some other passages, you know, have sought to govern our practices. And so what we, I think what we have attempted to do, what we're trying to do is commendable. Having said that, it's important that we recognize as Dr. Foster just pointed out, the restoration movement should be seen as ongoing. There's, there are still things that we need to restore, okay? Now, in our tradition, you know, we have often pointed out, like um, 
the signs of the New Testament church, right? You know, that, uh, you know, the, the way we worship and also like the church governmental structure, you know, you know, we, you know if you can identify the identifying marks of the New Testament church. And those are important, but I think there are some other issues as well that I think we have perhaps missed. For example, when Jesus says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And I, I bring that before simply to say that while we have been good at emphasizing restoring the letter of the New Testament, I think in some ways we have perhaps missed restoring the spirit of the uh, New Testament church because uh, Jesus would put love for one another at, at the top of uh, the identifying marks. And I think that's something. And so that's why it has to be ongoing. And, and the, the preachers and leaders have to con consistently and continuously call people back, you know, to what God has said. And I think one, one more little issue here that has, you know, we have in our tradition what you may regard as a truncated canon. And what I mean by that, a canon within the canon. Because traditionally, and, and of course we've inherited this, and I, I'm, I'm a product of it myself, you know, our, our canon, when we, if we really look at it carefully, has been Acts 2 to Revelation. And regrettably, we have ignored, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, which has emphasized, like, you know, loving your neighbor. If your enemy is, uh, if you're, someone is hungry, make sure he's fed. You know, the emphasis on social, social issues. And then, of course, the the seventh and eighth century prophets who emphasize the importance of caring for the orphans, the widows, and the strangers. And so that, that's the danger, in my estimation, of our imbibing a, a canon within the canon. And of course, we inherited that from the Campbells and, and others. So we are part of the restoration movement, but it's, it's ongoing. It, it's ongoing. And uh, thank you. Uh, in concert with the, and inculcated in what has already been stated, the restoration movement uh, or the restoration idea is an ideological concept that you can trace throughout history that is not necessarily birthed with just our movement, but it is a mindset that I think Dr. Winrow has, has already uh, indicated. And the goal of restoration is to go back to biblical Christianity, which we would uh, further narrow, and we have um, referred to New Testament Christianity. Um, with that being said, the restoration movement being an idea of going back to the Bible is we're not the only ones who have believed that. So what happens is we have to begin to think about what is the process that historically we believe is the way to get back to uh, what we call biblical Christianity because movements like Seventh-day Adventism would say that they're the remnant church or they are the original church. There are others who have had the mindset of going back. The question is what path did they take to get back? And I think this is where historically we are distinct because we have a certain pathway we take. Um, that relates to this idea of going back to the Bible. Also, throughout history, there have been statements that have indicated the disposition of going back, the idea of sola scriptura, or scripture only, the idea of the authority of scripture, are all remnants of the idea of going back into biblical Christianity. Where we probably have to eventually talk through is that process. And so what has developed from Baconism into Alexander Campbell's thought process and other restorers was a certain hermeneutical process that brings us back to that biblical Christianity, which would suggest a particular hermeneutical construct of direct command, approved example, necessary inference, being the way we determine what is authorized 
And through that motif, we believe that is a road that gets us back to biblical Christianity. So that's part of the historical conversation of New Testament Christianity is speaking about the road that we take to get back because we're not the only religious organization that believes in going back. So we have to begin to look at the distinction of the road that we're taking to establish this restoration movement motif. Additionally, I would suggest that as we talk through that, that sometimes what we have restored has been subjective rather than objective. So this speaks to what was just called the canon within a canon. It becomes we decided to emphasize certain aspects of New Testament Christianity to which we limited the scope through which we look at Christianity as a whole. So I think the concept of restoration is a powerful concept and is something that we embrace and should be proud of as an ongoing movement. I think where the divide happens and where the discussion begins to have some dichotomy depending on who you're talking with is the process we take to get back to New Testament Christianity. And I think that's where the conversation has to also begin. Let me go. I want to come in on this in terms of the, as he mentioned, the process. And historically, uh, they, they're definitely correct. We're not the only movement you know, that is born of the idea of restoration. Mormons, for example, considered themselves a restoration movement. You know, they were shaped in the crucible of the Renaissance as opposed to the Enlightenment. Uh, so, yes, you know, we're talking about restoration. But I think we need to. Uh, first identify as we talk about this impulse and that's why I talked about the movement as a as a movement that's based upon a perennial impulse that that comes out of the Christian faith uh, a biblical impulse for us such as Jude 3 the Bible are earnestly contend for the faith that was first delivered you know to the saints and that type of thing and then there's background you know that helps us you know with this process and that is to understand that the focal point of restoration is not restoring the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is unshakable. You know, we're not trying to restore saved people. That's not the idea of restoration. It's, re it's a restoration, it's, it's an ecclesial praxis, that is a church praxis as opposed to a salvation praxis. Now what I mean by that, for example, in the Old Testament, you remember after the, the establishment of the kingdom of Solomon, you know, then you had the son Rehoboam and Jeroboam, what happened? Division took place. And as a result of that division, you no longer had what is called a central sanctuary. Isn't that right? In other words, because Jeroboam went down to two places and set up a duplicate system, a counterfeit system that duplicated what they had in Jerusalem, but God said that thing became a sin. Why? Because that was a purpose for a central sanctuary. That was a purpose where everybody had to come and worship together because it was the political glue to the kingdom as well as the religious and spiritual glue to the kingdom. So when you talk about, you know, what, what is it that we are working on, it's not the idea uh, that being in the right sanctuary is what determines us to be Christians or not. I know that's going to be controversial. I know that's going to be controversial. The Jews were Jews before they went to the sanctuary. Understand that. Going into the sanctuary and the temple did not make them Jews. You know, but it did determine their worship. It did determine whether or not they were in line with God's vision for the kingdom. And when I say that the restoration motif is a, pro, is a prophetic rather than primitive, I'm simply saying that there's no church in the New Testament that we're trying to restore. What we're, what we're working on is the vision of that church, the high vision of the church as the kingdom of God. That's what needs to be restored. And so it is that vision of the church as the kingdom of God that influences, you know, what we do here on the ground. If we just simply take a... a, a on the ground approach, you know, to trying to restore the sanctuary, which is significantly important. You notice out of all the, all the reform movements that took place in the Old Testament, uh, after even Josiah's reform and, and the commendation that was made about those reform movements, the end result is they did not correct the sin of Jeroboam. 
While they did a lot of good things that was commendable and God commended them, but still the sin of Jeroboam remained. You know, and so the point is we see that same situation, you know, in our religious culture today where there's no central sanctuary. In the word of God, there's a central sanctuary. And so the point is, why is the sanctuary, the church as the sanctuary? And, and understand this, the concept of church in the Bible does not always correspond to the concept of body of Christ. Body of Christ often refer to the community of believers. Church is often used to refer to a sanctuary where, for example, women keep silent. Hello, somebody. Isn't that right? In other words, it is the gathering of the people of the community of God in terms of worship. And so the idea of restoration is re restoring that vision, that, uh, that vision of the kingdom where people can come together and experience true worship. People can come together and experience community. That's, in, that, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's a high value. And, and what we ought to be proud of in terms of our history is that we have, we have been bequeathed a high vision of the church as a sanctuary of worship. A high vision of the body of Christ as the community. A high vision of the word of God in terms of it being final authority. Those are the values that we have that we have to embrace and ought to be proud of. Um, I'm somewhat partial to uh, that expression, "search for the ancient order." You know, the the idea that part of what is restored by the Campbells and others is this this idea that we're all priests. Uh, we're not needing to go to God through a priest, but rather we can study the Word of God for ourselves. And we should be studying the word of God all the time. We should be working out our own salvation with, with fear and trembling. And we want to be transformed into the image of, of his dear son, right? The image of Christ. So to, to, to me, that's one of the critical parts of restoration or any sort of movement. Do we really have the kind of emphasis on God's word that we ought to have? Are we thinking about God's word? Are we praying about God's word? Are we meditating on the law of the Lord you know, day and night? Now, the president, when he was sharing some of, some of the problems and difficulties that he dealt with, he's praying, but he's thinking all the time. And he's coming up with things that, that, that help solve and resolve problems. And Christianity, if it's anything, should be practical. I want to take this um, selfish opportunity to recognize my parents and the audience. <laughs> and the reason um, Stanley and Joyce is because growing up, um, what I learned at the Shepherd Street Church of Christ and in many of our Church of Christ is that we were established in AD 33. Um, you go to some buildings and there was a brick. And I'm like, that brick came from AD 33? Oh my goodness, let's put this in a museum. <laughs> so here's a very practical question. How do we get from AD 33 to 2023? How do we get from 8033 to 2023, and what's the place of the restoration within that? Anyone can address this question. One thing we have to do, we got to make sure that we're preaching the gospel. I'm talking about the message now, and uh, we need to make sure we're teaching the message that God has uh, commission for us to teach uh, uh, as long as the world stands. That gospel. Now, you know, we shouldn't be hearing strange things because the gospel is pretty simple. Amen. Isn't that right? <laughs> no, Brother Office, nobody's after you. <laughs> 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 Amen. It's pretty simple. And that is uh, the same gospel that the apostles told is what we need to teach. And it's pretty plain and simple in the Bible to me. And uh, all of the admonitions from the apostles seem to be that we should preach it without changing it and trying to modify it, but declare the same gospel 
that they declared. I think everybody up here would agree with that. And uh, we have one gospel. And uh, the Bible makes it plain that it's the power of God unto salvation, unto everyone that uh, would obey that word. And so that's what I'm talking about, is that uh, the changes that are taking place in and around uh, has to do with folk that want to change or modify the gospel. But can we all agree that we need to teach the same gospel that the apostles taught? Amen. Yes, sir. Well, that's my position. And if we're going to get back and talking about the restoration, it's no point in talking about uh, uh, we appreciate the contributions that Alexander Campbell made, but I was reading some things about the Lunenberg, you know, letter that he answered from this woman in Virginia that um, uh, questioned his change in his message uh, from the Christian Baptist to the Millennial Harbinger. And uh, she said at one time you were teaching that it was for the remission of sins. But then all of a sudden you are saying that uh, if a person believes and repents, uh, then the person could be recognized as a Christian without being immersed. Now, so that gets down to the core of the matter. Do we need to have a changed gospel? And when the pressure was put on him by those in the Baptist movement in particular, then he tried to change and come back. But he had already released that letter. And so we ought to be careful now and make sure what we are teaching over here, you see, uh, five years earlier, it's the same thing we're gonna be teaching up here. The same gospel, that's what I'm trying to declare up here, is preach the same gospel and uh, don't change it. And it uh, doesn't matter where we went to school, we want to teach the same thing. I went uh, doing some postgraduate uh, studies at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary up here at Fort Worth. And the professor came in one day in class, and I was the only one, of course, a member of the Church of Christ in the class. And somebody raised a question. It was in uh, Christian music, Christian music. And uh, somebody asked a question about it and said, well, do we have, what is the, scriptural proof that we have for the mechanical instruments of music. And uh, the professor said, well, he cited and referenced uh, Psalm 150. But he was a very honest man. And he said, but when it comes to the New Testament, he said, we don't have that proof in the English or in the Greek. And uh, I just ducked my head like I was taking notes. But, because I already knew <laughs> what the Bible teaches about it. Amen? And this man was honest. He said, but we have it in there for its aesthetic effect because of the psychological, uh, you know, value that we get from it and the beauty of it. He said, that's why we have it. And uh, at least he was honest because I knew he didn't have, especially in the New Testament, and we know we're not under the old, so that's immaterial, uh, uh, in the New Testament, proof for it. Now we're hearing a lot of, you know, people skirting around in the brotherhood trying to recapture, and we gotta be careful with that. We gotta be careful with that, and I'm against that, uh, and uh, I hope the uh, panel is still with me up here now. But I believe, I believe in a cappella singing, amen. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, speaking of any of the little trimmings around, uh, you know, because I think that if, if, when it gets into some of those other areas about some people saying high praise and low praise, I don't get in it just so we're praising him. Uh, and uh, I don't think any of those matters would be a test of fellowship anyway. But that's what I'm saying. Thank you, and I agreed with the man uh, in the Baptist church, one of the professors, and he said it was no Bible for it. 
Thank you, Professor um, Foster. I just want to restate the question uh, for the panelists. How do we get from AD 33 to 2023? Thank you. I want to I want to comment on that. I think we have to be careful when we uh, deal with the concept of change, uh, because the Bible gives us what to do. Methodology is shaped by culture. Yeah. I was a part of reading uh, Brother Keeble's book. His biography was entitled "From Mule Back to Superjet with the Gospel." It simply means he's chronicling his life that when he started preaching the gospel, he was traveling by mule back. But when he ended his life, he was traveling by super jet. Now, if I were to write that, my biography wouldn't say from you back to super jet. It would say from super jet to the internet <laughs> with the gospel. And so the point is, methodology is dictated by the larger narrative. Isn't that right? When you talk about you know, the issue of instrumental music, for example, the fathers, the classic fathers, they didn't fight instrumental music on the same basis that we're fighting. They fought it on theological grounds. Basically, in other words, they were, they were this thing about substance versus shadow. They would argue the physical representation that you read about in Psalm 51. All of those guys, Clement of Alexander, Basil the Great, and all of those guys, they argued you know, that those expressions were not spiritual expressions. They were shadows. And so they argued on that type of ground you know and 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 their fight was not against what we, we fight we're fighting against denominationalism they were fighting against paganism you know that was their enemy and so every generation has its own battleground you know and so when we talk about even singing you know the early church the singing of the early church you wouldn't you're not going to find if you were to visit the church at car rent you ain't gonna be no fanny fanny crawford what's her name fanny j crawford Ain't gonna be none of her songs. In other words, because they chanted the psalms. It was just chanting. You didn't get to this issue of four-point harmony until after the 11th century. Isn't that right? And so methodology in terms of leading congregational singing, you know, is dictated even today. Why, did, why are churches using, using groups you know, to lead congregational singing. We have that at Reseda, by the way. We have, a, we have a worship team ministry. And it's based upon the fact that effective leading of four-point harmony is better done by a, by a representation of the church being able to hear their parts and follow after their parts and then fulfill the ultimate vision that worship is supposed to minister. Isn't that right? It's supposed to be a celebration. Hello, somebody. Not supposed to be a funeral. People are supposed to leave there refreshed and edified, galvanized. The Bible says in Hebrew, to do love and good works. In other words, you should be, feel better when you leave than before you came. You know, so the point is methods are utilized as a means of carrying out the ultimate vision of what the purpose is supposed to be. And if you're not fulfilling the purposes, then you're not really worshiping God accordingly. And so, so I, I said, you know, I, I said all of that to say, be careful when you talk about change, you know, because change, anything that anything living changes yes, because it's a sign of life. Yes. Show you a picture of yourself 20 years ago. <laughs> Hello, somebody. You don't look like you look 40 years ago. You may want to but you have matured. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and if you don't, if, if, if there's no change, that's simply you, you died. I wish I could tell you the story of Megar Evans when they exhumed his body. You know, he was assassinated when he was 40 years old. 40 years later, they exhumed his body. His son, that, that superintended that exhumation, you know, was a child at that time. When they opened that casket 40 years later, he was still 40 and a, an exact image of his son. His son was an exact image of him. Wow. Death froze his identity. Oh. Hello, somebody. It froze his identity in time. And there are churches that are frozen. Oh, I, I, I heard you they don't know how to adjust. They don't know how to make, make methodological 
changes in terms of carrying out what the ultimate vision of worship is, that is to minister to the saints and witness to the world. If you ain't witnessing, if your worship don't witness, something's wrong with it. If it ain't ministering to the people that come in terms of renewing them on, on a weekly basis as far as feeding them the word of God and allowing them the expression of their emotional uh, nature, laying that out prostrate before God, they're not worshiping. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate what you just said. But you know, there ain't no leading by group in the New Testament. There's no direct command, approved example, or necessary inference. <laughs> Even hermeneutics is culturally, is culturally constructed. You know, I was in a class with, with Dr. Thomas Albright and Ron Highfield. When they put forth the idea, what came to be known as a new hermeneutic, and what they were simply saying is, it's really not a new hermeneutic. They were just simply saying that your view of God, your view of the Holy Spirit, your view of, of the church, it informs your interpretation. In other words, an exegete, an exegete doesn't work in a vacuum. You know, that he brings certain things to the text. You know, so when you talk about interpreting scripture, uh, the, your theological understanding feeds into that interpretation. Now, Thomas Albright would be the first to admit that what we call CIE, C -E, command, example inference. and inference he said that is nothing wrong with that hermeneutic if your purpose is to rediscover the forms and patterns of the new testament church but if you're trying to do a a, a study of the holy spirit that hermeneutic ain't gonna do you no good it's gonna lead you down the wrong pathways the point is so hermeneutics are often developed within the context you know, within a historical context for particular purposes. And it's always an ongoing process of development. I, I threw that in the teaser. Uh, thank you for responding to that. Now let me answer your question, Stanley. How do we get from AD 33 to where we are? And I'd like to give it a theological posture and then we can go from there. I don't know if I'm, you're asking me, Brother Fawcett, explain my view on, uh, I don't know if that's what that is, but I will, but let no, me answer I, the question first. Okay. And, but I don't know if that's what well, that is. Let me quickly say that uh, I want the audience to recognize that nobody up here is saying that they're bringing in the instrument. Oh, okay. Go okay. ahead. Good deal. Then I can answer the question. Um, um, there, is a, there is a term in the New Testament um, that comes from a root word, tupos, from which we have the English translation pattern. And as it relates to how we get from AD 33 to the present day is through the understanding that there is within scripture a pattern that is to be obeyed and accepted as it relates to the gospel of Christ Jesus in harmony with what Dr. Foster indicated the gospel of Jesus Christ must be taught and preached as it was articulated by apostolic pattern. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 17, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form, that pattern of doctrine. It is indicated within that context, he mentions baptism through death, burial, and resurrection, which is the recapitulation of what Jesus did, and that pattern frees us from sin. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13 and 14, hold fast to that form, that pattern of sound words which you have heard of me. Um, and so we have within scripture the idea and concept of pattern that I believe first and foremost relates to how we articulate gospel and then can go wider. But I believe the way we get back to New Testament Christianity or biblical Christianity is through an acceptance theologically of the fact that there is a pattern that must be accepted and a pattern by which we obey and are freed from sin. 
And I believe that pattern, first and foremost, we should understand the pattern of what it means to preach the gospel and respond to the gospel of Christ Jesus. So as just a theological foundation of how we get from AD 33 to now, I believe it's not by tracing church lineage because you can't trace our lineage physically back to Pentecost, but you can obey the same gospel and that becomes the lineage. So the same gospel obeyed on the first Pentecost after the resurrection is the same gospel that we should obey today. And Jesus said repentance and remission of sin should be preached beginning from Jerusalem. I do know some translations say at Jerusalem, but the better translation is from Jerusalem, which is but to say it would start in Jerusalem, but it wouldn't stay in Jerusalem. That gospel is to be a perpetual message. And that is fundamentally how we get back to New Testament Christianity. I would, I would like to offer just uh, a historical perspective and restoration movement, Stone Campbell movement. I think it's important to consider that there were two Alexander Campbells. And I'm influenced by Richard Hughes uh, when, you make, when I make these observations here. The Alexander Campbell of the Christian Baptist, which he published from 1823 to 1830, was very legalistic, dogmatic. He published a treatise entitled The Third Epistle of Peter in which he ridiculed and denounced uh, preachers who were uh, morally uh, decadent and so forth, okay? That, that Campbell was very rigid in his um, theological posture. But the Alexander, once he's ousted from the Baptist faith, and he was, by the way, baptized by a Baptist preacher, Matthias Luce, and he, he breaks, he's ousted from the Baptist and he launches the Millennial Harbinger. This Alexander Campbell is more open. He's more cordial toward his religious neighbors. And, and there were a couple of reasons for that uh, change, if you will, uh, cordiality in that. First of all, um, we know that because he became the president of the American Missionary Society in 1849. He earlier, seeing the Christian Baptist, he denounced it. Uh, he also debated uh, John B. Purcell, John Baptist Purcell, who was a Roman Catholic bishop. So Campbell, by the time of the 1830s, 1837 to be more specific, he is now the champion or perceived champion of American Protestantism. And then, of course, in 1840, he launched uh, what is now Bethany College. And so I, I bring that before us, brothers and sisters, just to kind of offer this point of observation that I think what we have to remember today is always give people room to grow. You know, Campbell matured, if you will. Okay, now, I'm not saying I agree with everything, but how many of us, when you first became a member of the church, compared to where you are now, you don't hold to all the same positions? Because when you really immerse yourself into the word, and I agree with Dr. Rimro, one of our strengths is that we... We hold a high, we allow the word of God to reign free. We, we encourage people to immerse ourselves in the word. And th there are things, man, I, I didn't understand or even believe that Christians, we had the Holy Spirit. When I was in, uh, first became a member of the church, but I had to grow in, in my understanding that, hey, man, when you trust Christ, when you receive, repent, and are baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit. But because we negatively reacted to Pentecostalism, yes. and we associated the gift of the Holy Spirit with ecstatic expressions, yes. we all together kind of say, no, we don't have, but that's not true. Paul said, if any man has not right. the Spirit of Christ, he is 
none of his. And so, and then, and so there has to be room for growth. Think about Paul. Did Paul, you know, when you consider in Acts 13, he fell out with John Mark, Acts 15, but then, you know, on down the road, he said, hey, you know, I need this brother. He's profitable for me. I say that simply to say that I believe that I can disagree with you and still view you as my brother. Do y'all think that's possible? And then having said that, I want to say one more thing. I believe that we, we can't be like James, Peter, James, and John in 2023. From the standpoint, the way they dress, what they ate, the way they worship, they didn't worship in church buildings. Okay, you know, we cannot be completely like the New Testament church, but guess what? All of us can be like Jesus. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ. That's how I can be like Jesus. And the goal is not to be like Paul, not to be like Peter, James, and John. My goal is to be like Jesus. That's, that's how I see it. Okay. Thank you very much. Just to uh, reiterate something that I said in my presentation earlier today, this is from the pen of Walter Scott. He said, in other words, brethren, to make us see the beauty and perfection of the gospel theory as devised by God, faith is to destroy the love of sin, repentance to destroy the practice of it, baptism the state of it, remission the guilt of it, the spirit the power of it, and resurrection to destroy the punishment of sin so that the last enemy, death, will be destroyed. So when I think about the question, I, I, I think about Myself as an individual Christian, what do I need to do to be more like God? Am I, when I'm praying, am I, am I praying for my enemies? Do I love my wife the, the way that I should? Am I restoring that part of what God wants me to be? Am I being transformed into the image of Jesus? If I'm doing those things, I'm about my father's business, and I feel like I'm not too far from the kingdom of God. And I'll share one last thought. My father used to tell me all the time, he would say, son, it's not what I don't understand about the Bible that bothers me. It's what I understand about the Bible. <laughs> so we, sh we should be doing the things that we understand. I'm going to present one more question before we open it up. Um, I'm going to need some help with the microphones because I'm sure you have a lot of questions that uh, we want to um, ask this most uh, capable panel. Um, so my mind takes me back to uh, junior high school. I'm in a cafeteria and I'm, I'm trying to uh, teach my friends about uh, the Church of Christ and the body of Christ, right? And one of my friends said, oh, you're, you're just a Campbellite. And I was like, no, I'm not. And um, I really didn't have any knowledge of this Alexander Campbell person. So my question for you is, uh, what is the relationship um, of the Churches of Christ uh, with Alexander Campbell? Is there a relationship? Uh, should we have one? Um, is this someone that we should just disregard or should we be engaged um, intellectually and theologically with Alexander Campbell in the 21st century? So what is or is there a relationship with the Churches of Christ and Alexander Campbell? You know, I would say um, that God's vision for the church stands in judgment of our relationship to anyone, our relationship to Campbell, you know, what we understand, you know, God has established and what we understand the church to be about, uh, that vision, that's why I say it's a prophetic vision because it transcends culture, it transcends history, and it stands in judgment of culture and history. You know, so we make evaluations based upon what God's vision for the church is. That was a time when we referred to the church as non-denominational isn't that right but you notice now that that term has changed meanings it don't mean what we used to mean by it and so I, I can't use that in it when I refer to Christianity as I understand it in the word of God I just use the term undenominational Christianity because non-denominational Christianity has come to mean some movement that is separate from its denominational hierarchy and belong to a particular individual that's not God's vision for the church. And so the point is that, you know, when we understand the church as consistent with being the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, you know, it is that vision that has to 
enable us to evaluate, yeah. you know, what is it about Campbell? What is it about Campbell that we can embrace? And what is it about him that we cannot embrace? I remember uh, when I was teaching at Pepperdine, one of the professors that we, that we used to teach classes with, uh, Dr. Richard Hughes, which you referred to, uh, when we did history, black history, um, <laughs> we would have to take our students to a denominational church to demonstrate, you know, how black culture is integrated into Christian expression. Couldn't bring him to our church. When he first visited my congregation, he, he said I was just overwhelmed on how much you guys have just denounced your own culture, you know, to embrace the practices of white folk. Y'all can't even clap your hand in your church, <laughs> you know. The point is, we have surrendered so much of who we are to embrace who they, who they were or whatever, you know. So the point is, uh, all I'm saying is, when we understand the high vision of the church as God has given to us, we use that vision to do evaluations. And that's, that's, that would be my response. Our relationship to Alexander Campbell has to be um, filtered through our theological conviction that Jesus Christ is the founder of the church. So before there is any such personage as Alexander Campbell, we can only view him as what did he contribute to the mission of restoring New Testament Christianity without making him synonymous with being the start of New Testament Christianity. Um, to that end, what we look at with Alexander Campbell is his theological contribution and his disposition to undenominational Christianity. He may not have used that term, but that was his idea. His idea was that we should not be trapped or identified by denominational affiliation and we begin to get introduced to the idea of Christians only. And the idea of Christians only was that um, we are not affiliated or should not be identified with denominational affiliations that are not rooted in divine origin. And so that contribution is what we look at. Now if we evaluated his eschatology, we're gonna struggle because his eschatology is very different from what many of us would accept today relative to the historical arguments of premillennialism, postmillennialism, and things of that nature. Uh, when you begin to, to, to get into his mindset on that, well, you're gonna find some dichotomy between what many of us accept today and what he would accept. And so I believe that we look at the contributions of Alexander Campbell relative to the disposition of restoration movement and not necessarily make him synonymous, as some would say, call us Campbellites, as if he's the founder of the New Testament. He's not that. Yeah, if I may, uh, <clears throat> I agree with that wholeheartedly. But you have to admit that he made a great contribution yeah. to the church as we know it today. Church of Christ, uh, you know, he picked up some things from his father, Thomas Campbell, of course, and that is about the silence argument and so on. And uh, I think that was a great thing that he brought in, you know, uh, from Thomas Campbell's, speak for the Bible, speak and be silent where the Bible's silent. And when we look at uh, Alexander uh, Campbell, uh, 1788 to 1866, is that about right? Uh-huh, all right, so I tell people, you know, we don't start there. We, we, we need to go back to the Bible and stay with the Bible. And that's what I think we need to take out of here today from this panel is that we're gonna commit ourselves to stay with the Bible and not to put our hope and trust in any man because some people believe that today that Alexander Campbell is the founder of the Church of Christ and that's just not true I'm glad you brought that out amen so that's what I believe yeah he made great contribution to the church and we don't need to deny that and uh, we need to accept it because uh, it's a part of who we are mm -hmm. You know, he not only made, uh, you know, great contributions, he made contributions that we're often not cognizant of. And I was just thinking of the fact that every person here has four sets of great-grandparents. 
those great grandparents affected your life in very substantial ways, but the truth is most of us can't name all of them. A lot of us would be doing well to name one or two or three of them. And I think the same thing is true with Alexander Campbell. You know, you talk about people bringing Campbell up to you and you not even being aware of it. The, the influence of Campbell is much more per pervasive than I think we're aware of. And I think you saw that from Dr. Robinson's presentation where he's showing quotations from people like Bowser and Keeble and S.R. Cassius about Campbell, having an influence on their lives. They influenced our lives. So I, th I think there's a tremendous influence still, still present. Um, his uh, one, number one, uh, you know, Alexander Campbell was an incredible debater. I mean, his ability to articulate his theological postures were extremely profound. I think a good study also is to evaluate his relationship with Barton W. Stone in the areas where there were theological disagreement, yet the overarching push was unity in restoration movement. And I just think it's a good study to look at areas where there were theological dichotomy between the two, even down to something as simple as what do you call the movement? I mean, there was, there was various ways they described the restoration movement to which they, it took time for them to agree on things of that nature. I think we would do good to learn from the positive example that there were restorers who did not have uniformity across the board on all aspects of Christian faith, but did see value in finding what should be core to the restoration concept. And I think we would do good to revisit those ideas of what is core and, and then admit that there will always be areas where there's dichotomy. That's a good point. And you know, the Campbell group and the Stone group came together in 1832 and formally, but beneath the surface, there were vast differences. Uh, one in particular that stands out is that Stone embraced emotional expressions in worship because he was a part of the Cambridge revivals where there was singing and dancing and shouting and people, I mean, being quote unquote slain in the spirit. And he argued that that was the work of God, that emotional expression was the work of God because he, he, these are his words, paraphrasing, that the emotionalism, the fervor of the great awakening cut loose the bonds of slavery and that it freed a lot of the enslaved black people. And so he endorsed, he embraced, he welcomed, you know, shouting and all that stuff. But Campbell, see, was just the opposite. And so he, you know, believed that, you know, you should approach God and the Bibles scientifically and rationally and churches of Christ. See, we have picked up on that. We, we were more influenced in that area by the Campbell side right. than we were, you know, the, the Stone side. And so, and, and that's why I contend that we're still working our way uh, through some of these things. And so... Uh, and then there are other differences as well. In fact, the, the most, the best book on Campbell right now was published by, written by uh, Doug Foster, and a very good book. And he makes the case in that book that Campbell established Bethany College because he wanted to eliminate tuberculosis. You know, and, and, and he said he found that in his research and so here was a guy, even though he was a religious leader, religious reformer, who also made a contribution to, to medicine. I thought that was quite fascinating. So, and you know what? Having said all of that, ladies and gentlemen, I realize that our fellowship is imperfect. We have our flaws, faults, and foibles. But I just want y'all to know I ain't going nowhere because I thank God for, for what he has done for me in the context of Churches of Christ. Yeah. Now I know some might leave, y'all can go, but I'm staying. And just as a quick follow-up, um, Dr. Robinson, earlier you mentioned that we need to write our songs, we need to um, have uh, scholars within the African-American tradition uh, write in our stories because there's ways in which we've been influenced 
by this tradition, um, ecclesiologically, like with the gospel advocate, right? And the songs that came from a Presbyterian tradition and you gave honor to um, one of the greats of, of this institution, Sylvia Rose. And then also, um, Dr. Winrow, you, you, you made a, a comment earlier about you know, some of the uh, shackles associated with this tradition. So uh, before we go to the audience, what are some things that are obstacles related to um, this tradition? Uh, maybe it's in hermeneutic, maybe it's um, some of the ideologies associated with the restoration movement that have prevented us from being African-American or black, right? Um, so maybe let's hear, um, you know, what are some of the things that we can uh, think through that are more so associated with the restoration movement and not scripture? Okay. I, I, th I think one thing is that uh, we, you know, until we can put the emphasis on singing, singing in the church, just singing, and uh, put funds behind it, uh, because it's a very important area. And uh, how many of you were here last night and heard uh, Craig, uh, this young man, sang, sing last night? He had us on our feet. You know, people that usually would be sleeping. They were up. <laughs> I mean, and uh, we need to uh, put money behind singing so we can be at our very best. And, uh, you know, we, we put money behind everything else, workshops and all of this, and we skip that area. And we're going to lose ground pretty soon because these young people are not buying it. They're not buying it. They want to be able to come to, to the house of God and leave on a high, on a high, you have to be careful when you're talking about getting high, but I'm talking about on, on a, you know what I mean, amen. When they say amen. And uh, we find it, uh, incidentally, you know, now that I'm back at the school and I'm very pleased to be back. Uh, thank you, Brother Simpson, for bringing me back. But you should get in on some of our chapel programs. Mm. I tell you, I'm telling you, you, you will never forget it. These young people, I mean, we have a great time in chapel here at Southwestern Christian College. We don't have any dead services. <laughs> Everything is good, I tell you. And you. If you don't believe it, you don't have to take my word. Just come and be a part of it. I would just add that, you know, we, man, thank God for Sister Sylvia Rose. Um, you know, we learn to sing about the Holy Spirit from Sister Rose yeah. wow. in, in a faith tradition that relegated the Holy Spirit to a place of inferiority. You know, Holy Spirit dwell in me, touch my eyes that I might see all your goodness, grace, and power. Stay beside me, be my drink, be my living bread, keep me sheltered, keep me fed. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. You know, that's why, you know, I, I encourage young people or older people, middle, you know, let's write some of our own songs. Mm. Now, just you have to immerse yourself in, in scripture yeah. to make sure you're producing, you know, songs that are scriptural yeah. as well as, of course, uh, spiritual. You know, Chris Turner and there, there are others who are, who are outstanding uh, song arrangers uh, who can arrange songs. And so I encourage that, you know, open the floodgates of heaven. You know, you know, we sing a lot of these songs from people outside of our fellowship and then we condemn them. You know, so to me, that's a paradox, you know. So I said, man, if you're going to condemn the folk, at least write your own stuff, okay? But, but anyhow, that, that's what I would say to that, all right? Thank you. You mentioned some of the, your question was in regards to some of the obstacles or perhaps 
um, some of the difficulties. Yeah, maybe what are some of the neg we mentioned some of the positive con contributions, but some of the hindrances with the tradition. I think in concert with what was just stated, I want to use uh, Dr. Foss's uh, very poignant and true statement that we are uh, an a cappella church, and we ought to be proud of that, yes. and we ought to stay with that. Yes. Um, where we where the elephant comes in is when we invest in the creativity within the expression of a cappella, mm -hmm. and then kill that. Yeah. So what we'll do mm -hmm. is. We say we're a cappella, but we don't maximize yeah, that's right. what that, could, that experience could be. Right. So as soon as you get a church with four-part harmony, now you want to argue that's a sin because we're supposed to have one dude up there. Yeah. And we don't deal with that elephant. We are good for sidestepping elephants. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we castigate the one who's trying to maximize creativity right. And then we send them to hell for maximized creativity within the context of a cappella. Right. And then um, we get to the space where we give that person a pass because we're accustomed to fighting only those who see permission. So if you see permission, we kill it. And then the guy that's drawing a law where God did not draw a law, we give him a pass. So we let the legalist live and the so-called liberal get assassinated. That's an elephant in the room that we don't talk about. And another elephant is we're not good at deciphering the difference between tradition and truth. Uh, I don't know too many folk that don't believe that we should stay with truth, but how we define what is that truth. Sometimes we're not honest with those elephants. And then we label folk heretic and everything else because something has been done that goes against the context of what you have historically done that may not be a breach of scripture but a breach of your tradition now if we don't deal with that elephant we'll stay divided and then we will not have uh, the beauty of that so if we're honest and I'm that dude that'll make you honest um, those are the elephants where, where a lot of y'all are sent to hell for clapping more than one song leader. You send to hell for a host of things yeah. within the arena of a cappella, right. and that never gets addressed. Right. And so we don't deal with those shackles. Lastly, my other, um, because don't get me started, Dr. Seems just got me back here, and I want to respect my president, and I said my president. I'm good with him. I say he's a good dude. He, of course, he's been a heretic way before I was ever. Here. So that's okay. We we in good space. There's, we in good space. That's my dude. Yeah. Ain't nothing new here. Praise God. Y'all trying to make me the black sheep. The president was a black sheep, <laughs> and that's an intelligent guy. We thank God for what he's doing in this space. Somebody that we didn't respect and that we didn't give credence to who we tried to kill is leading a resurrection. We don't respect that stuff. Y'all just made me a new target. I'm okay with that. There'll be a new dude after a while. So, but the other elephant is, yeah, we need to reevaluate how we approach a text. So hermeneutical practice is another elephant. It's not about do we believe in the authority of scripture. And it's not the issue in every case. In most cases, you ask somebody sitting next to you, do they believe in the authority of scripture? They're going to say yes. It's not the issue. The issue is how do you approach interpreting the text to determine orthodoxy? That we don't always agree on that process. And if we don't get honest, we will have these panel discussions that I think are wonderful, but at the end of the day, we will stay, we'll walk out and still be divided and give labels to who make us uncomfortable because we're not really respecting history. We're not respecting textual integrity and we are afraid to study. And those are some of the elephants. I got more, but I'm sure you guys got some pregnant elephants too. Well, I appreciate that. I, I want to pick it back off of the statement that you made about tradition because I'm guilty, I came up uh, in that framework of one sung leader, and I thought that that was it. Yeah. 
But in the early 70s, I was fortunate enough to get a meeting, uh, a gospel meeting with Brother Ari and Hogan. Mm. And I thought he was at the pinnacle. Yeah. Yeah. So once I got there, I was surprised. Brother Hogan had one song lead on one corner <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and another one on the other. That's a fact. And so when I came out of there, I said, now, the, the wind is open and the door is open. <laughs> because we all know Brother Hogan and his reputation. And so when you really look at it, God never told us how many sung leaders there. Amen. He never told us that. And so, you know, that's when you get into making laws where God didn't make laws. And so I think I said enough on that. But. I, I would very much agree with the panel. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that has made us a great movement is argumentation and debate, getting people to think about the scriptures. The thing that's caused us more problems than anything else is argumentation and debate. <laughs> we, we have a hard time sometimes knowing what's a hill worth dying on. And I, I use this expression at work all the time. People will come to me and they're all wound up about some ridiculous issue. And they're right, 100% right about what they're mad about. But it doesn't matter. And every time that I make an issue out of something that doesn't really matter, I use up a little bit of my influence. That's right. That's right. And eventually my influence is going to be gone and people will look at you like you're a nut every time you're, you're headed that way. And that, that's caused us a lot of trouble. And I'm not going to give any specific examples because I haven't been here long enough to be this fellowship. So. <laughs> we would like to now um, turn to the audience um, with your questions uh, for this panel. This is a wonderful, but hasn't this been a great conversation so far? I <laughs> just uh, really appreciate the different perspectives, you know, uh, the dialectical tension, because that's through the wrestling, that's how we get blessed like Jacob who became Israel through wrestling with God. Now we will take um, questions from the audience. The back, to my back right. The question uh, that we hear is what is the impact of race, especially um, when you have the financialization of, of white uh, members like A.M. Burton, right, who are financializing the gospel and in many ways helping to set up the churches. What is the relationship on that on black churches? Is that correct? It was quite profound. And yes, it did impact. Let me show you how and why. Whenever Brother Keeble established a congregation, immediately he signed that congregation up with the Gospel Advocate subscription list. In fact, Brother Keeble, by the 1950s, was inducted into what they call, the Gospel Advocate called the, the Century Club, in that he had signed so many people, so many churches up, uh, with the gospel advocate that he was given that special status. And so again, so these congregations that are established in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they are reading scripture through the lenses of the gospel advocate. And consequently, the leaders, the white leaders of the gospel advocate espoused a more restrained uh, approach to worship. And consequently, that, that did indeed have a profound uh, impact. And of course, Brother Keeble, uh, the presentation I made earlier where he says uh, that the more you get the gospel, it knocks the, 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 knocks the monkey notion out, okay? And Annie C. Tuggle, who says she, prefer, she preferred a religion with no hooping or hollering, you know? So again, all of those, in my viewpoint, are examples of the influence that our white brothers had. And of course, you know, Brother Keeble, he would not contest that. He would not contest that because had he challenged the racial status quo or had he contested 
the theological practices of Churches of Christ, you know, his funding would have been immediately cut off. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Anyone else want to address that question? Okay. Go ahead, sir. On, on that statement about, you know, Marsh Keeble, but conversely, would that have also impacted C.P. Bow as he was more unaccommodating towards, and he went his own way, established his own paper, uh, you know, the, what, what, what is our, our, the Christian echo? And so I'm just saying, would his, for lack of a better term, those who came up underneath him, would they have had a different experience in terms of probably being more uh, expressive of African American culture, in that he broke away from those white oppressors to some extent. Yeah, I, my response to that would be uh, it's, it's somewhat paradoxical in that, on the one hand, G.P. Bowser. He moved in an independent direction when it came to his posture on race, you know, with uh, establishing his own schools, launching the Christian Echo, speaking out against racial discrimination. And so that, that stamped him as different from Keeble, to be sure. Yet when it came to his theological posture, he would have aligned more with, with Brother Keeble. Uh, the reason I say that is because here's a quote uh, from Bowser in 1928, quote, as they, talking about African Americans, become more enlightened, they become less emotional. And so uh, that, that gives us some indication now that uh, Bowser would have leaned that, but, but here's the kind of a, another paradox, see, Arin Hogan came under the influence of G.P. Bowser, but yet, you know, the testimony of Brother Foster uh, suggest that you know he definitely would have been more open to the ex emotional expressions and worship. In fact, I have it documented in my book, Hard Fighting Soldiers, where Arian Hogan was pushing singing groups, singing groups as early as 1939. So here's a dude who, I mean, yes, while he came under the influence of Bowser, is a guy who is willing in some areas to kind of walk in an independent path. And I think that's quite fascinating. Kind of like Fred Gray, he came into the influence of Marshall Keeble, but when he came to civil rights, you know, he, he went chartered his own course. So there, there are a lot of paradoxes. And so that's why I too, for as a, as a historian, I approach this with a degree of humility because as we look at Brother Keeble, Bowser and others, they had imperfections. And so I got to remember, man, they were human beings. And guess what? There are some folk coming after me. When they examine me, my writings, they're going to say, man, Brother Robinson, you know, he, you know, he was, had it going on, man, but he was off on this. He was off on that. And so I've, I've learned as a historian, man, to... I admire and appreciate, but also recognize that they had limitations, just like I do. You know, I'd like to comment on that. Um, and I would just encourage, you know, in developing the quotes, especially from Brother Keeble, uh, that you be very careful in contextualizing. Um, I've read a lot of things that have been written about Brother Keeble uh, that I know from my own personal knowledge of Brother Keeble and experience with Brother Keeble that it just wasn't so. You know, some would paint Brother Keeble as an Uncle Tom. He was nobody's Uncle Tom. <laughs> Brother Keeble was a man before his time. Yeah. And he could say things to a white audience that none of us could get away with saying. Yeah. You know, I've seen him critique the iceness of the white church, you know, while he's preaching, you know, and say those things uh, without reservation. You know, and so I, I just say, you know, just, you know, we, we need to be careful when we talk about Brother Keeble promoting, 
you know, the idea of, of non-emotional emotion emotional expressions. Because a lot of what Brother Keeble said in his sermons about emotionalism had everything to do with denominations. You know, talk about people jumping over pews and all that kind of stuff. It had nothing to do with, well, I'm saying, I don't know, and I respect your research because you, you know better than me. You know, but I'm just speaking from my own experience as a child, listening to a man speak hour after hour and, and not wanting him to conclude. Can you imagine that holding the, holding the attention of an 11-year-old kid, you know, and, and just could listen to him forever, you know, without wanting him to end that message. But I'm telling you, he was, he was, he was, he was a man's man. You know, that's what I know about Brother Keeble. He was a man's man. And, uh, and he was not afraid, you know, to say what needed to be said. The only thing that you have to uh, recognize about Brother Keeble is Brother Keeble believes strongly. Now, I know this probably wasn't one of his words, but it's mine. And looking back, Brother Keeble believes strongly in the sovereignty of God. That's why he was a pacifist. In other words, uh, when the civil rights movement came to, uh, came to Nashville, we couldn't go down and march. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't let us get involved in, in, in that. You know, he was basically a, a, a pacifist, believing that when God is ready to move us from one position to another, that's God's, de that's God's determination. And, and so you have to look at him in that way. You know, kind of like, like Martin Luther, you know, of the ref reformer. You know, he was strong on the sovereignty of God. You know, and so Keeble was strong in that area. And, it's, and some interpret that, you know, in ways that, uh, you know, to me is not a reflection of who the man really was. And so I, I would just say, you know, just look at those statements and contextualize them, you know, to make sure, you know, that when he talks about emotionalism, uh, that he's really, you know, referring to or not talking about charismatics. Brother Keeble was very, very wise in his statements as well, and it brought to mind one of the ones that uh, stayed with me, and he would put himself into action. He says, now, some of us are cold while the others of us are frozen. And, 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 and he would be talking to a, primarily a white audience and he could get by with it because he knew how to put it out there. And that took a great deal of wisdom. I, I think God dealt with him in a great way. I won't get into all of that because, but I, I just think God, he was special like brother Seamster. He was special. And I believe in that, the anointing process. But that's another conversation. That's another conversation. I'm in, in concert again with what has been stated. Um, my mentor, uh, Dr. W.F. Washington, who had an opportunity to sit under Marshall Keeble, one of the things I adore about my training with him was his emphasis on knowing our history and understanding the concept of mentorship. And one of the things he said about Marshall Keeble that I mentioned at Lipscomb University where Dr. Um, Robinson and I had a chance to speak on a program where we were honoring Fred Gray and Marshall Keeble's legacy was that um, when you hear terms like emotionalism um, and you speak about, well, what would Marshall Keeble think about our emotionalism? You can't ask that because what he was defining as emotionalism is not what we're defining as emotionalism. His context defines the word that he's, or the word we're using to describe what he was against. And so, uh, as Dr. Wimmer indicated, much of what he, he talked about regarding that was against charismatic expression. Um, however, Marshall Keeble, in reference to his social context, uh, navigated his context for the mission he thought was important for him to do. So how he navigated racism and how he navigated uh, the Caucasian element, you have to understand it wasn't about him being an Uncle Tom, but it was about him navigating what he thought was gonna benefit the mission he was trying to accomplish. And so that was often criticized many times by the G.P. Bowser School. It was uh, G.P. Bowser thought 
uh, criticize in many cases the the methodology of a Marshall Keeble and it gets labeled a certain way when that didn't represent the mindset of Marshall Keeble. So I just want to be sure that any personage we study we have to contextualize and every any term we're using about those people has to be contextualized. Otherwise we will add a position to a person and that person is sitting there proverbially saying that's not what I'm talking about at all. And so we need to be very careful about how we assign definitions to people that may not have actually operated in that definition. Just going to add, you know, we're all creatures of our time. And Brother Keeble was a person of his time. Brother Burton was a person of his time. Uh, there's an interview that Marshall Keeble does with J.E. Choate in 1966. And in this interview, they're talking about A.M. Burton. And A.M. Burton's attitude was that when you brought an African-American off the farm, educated and they should go back to the farm and brother Keeble's like that's just silly yeah. and he said now brother Burton only had 10 12 weeks of education in his entire life but he was a genius at making money he loved brother Keeble and he you know we would certainly describe A.M. Burton as a racist beyond, beyond any doubt right because that's where he was coming from he's doing the best he can based on what he knows as is brother Keeble Brother Keeble knows the Bible backwards and forwards as well as, as anyone I've ever studied. But he's got something else because there's a lot of people know the Bible well. And that is he knows human beings yeah. backwards and forwards. And th this, this is what makes him so successful. And I wanted to just share this is a little bit of this interview with Brother Choate. And they're talking about integration. And Choate is bemoaning the fact that they, they didn't integrate uh, Lipscomb sooner. And Keeble goes, that's right. And Choate says, we should have got in right in behind it. And Keeble says, we'd have cleaned up with it, and the church would have been among our race like it is among you all. We'd have swaddled up the Negroes here in Nashville. But he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't see it. He's talking about A.M. Burton. He, he can't get Brother Burton to see it. It's not that he's not having these conversations with people privately, but he, he's, he's careful about you know, trying to cause offense publicly. Choate says, and I regret, and now he says, of course, I know the Nashville Bible School, Lipscomb, they weren't even out of debt until recent years. So Choate's trying to make an excuse about money. Keeble says, but you see here, brother, we're integrating right now out there at Lipscomb University just because we had to follow somebody else, but we should have led. Choate says, that's right. And then Keeble says in the most plaintive voice you can imagine, we should have led. I would have been so glad if we could have led this. We missed many a man that would have been in the Church of Christ if we had let it. So Keeble, Keeble is a smart, smart man. He sees everything, but he wants to save as many souls as he can. And I think that's what drives him publicly and privately. Keeble's an honest man. He tells people the truth, but he, he's, he's doing things in a context that it's impossible for me to completely relate to. We have some other questions, wonderful responses from our uh, panel. I see uh, one hand here. Yes. Yes, sir. I appreciate that answer. You, you you helped me a little bit because I've been struggling here when I heard Dr. Robinson say, I mentioned the word channel slavery. Channel slavery, uh, the slaves were not even considered to be human. And so you got people who don't even consider you to be human. I'm having struggling with how, how does that process now they want us to go to heaven and we're not human. And so you send the gospel advocate into those communities for what purpose? We know that slave owners hired Willie Lynch to teach them how to keep us slaves, to, to make us go back to the plantation. And so how do you reconcile that? And then when you go to David Lewis right now, you still have slave owners on the walls. When everybody else was taking those relics, relics of monuments from slaves, tearing them down in cities. They're still on the walls in some of our schools. You have former slave owners. You have uh, people who promoted slave, slavery and fought against the freedom of slaves still on the walls, and yet we say that they want us to go to heaven. I know we have a couple of other questions, so maybe if we can uh, speak to the, um, the question and then we can take some more from the audience. C. 
See, that, that, that's, that's a very hard question in a lot of ways. And one thing you have to understand, too, is David Lipscomb himself owned a few slaves before the Civil War. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so I, I think a part of it is you have to understand that, you know, none of us are static. If, if you looked at the worst thing I did in my life when I'm 20 years old and you showed it to me now, I would feel pretty embarrassed. If, it, if somebody had videotaped it and put it on YouTube, which we seem to be a culture obsessed with that kind of thing, and they took your worst moment, how, you know, how, how, how good would you look? And I think sometimes this, this is what we do. Lipscomb is a person of his time. It doesn't justify it. Slavery was absolutely evil. And... Uh, you know, it took, took, a, it took a war of four years, 600,000 casualties to, you know, to, to eliminate slavery. So those are good questions, right? I mean, and I think they're questions we need to ask. I'm not sure that I've got great answers for, for them. But you have to go back and, and put yourself in a totally different time and, and understand the incredible poverty that most black people are living in when, when all this is going on as well. Um, there's not a lot of power in the black community. There, there, there are all kinds of things that, that color all this. Keeble, though, in all of it, is convinced most important thing is teach people the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's going to do whatever he can to save the most people that he, that he possibly can. And sometimes it looks to us and looking back, well, why were you so close to A.M. Burton, who obviously was very ignorant when it came to black people? But, but some of the answer is Brother Burton's heart was in the right place in spite of his ignorance and in spite of his folly. And we sometimes don't give each other enough grace, and we don't, we don't understand that we've all sinned, and we've all come short of the glory of God, and I don't want justice. I want mercy. Some people still don't believe that we're human. That's why they can walk in a room and shoot us all up. They can, the police can walk up and shoot us up. We're not human. We're like a roach. You don't have no thoughts about killing a roach. You kill it. And recently, when I turned CNN on. I heard the Jews over uh, in, in Jerusalem saying they have dehumanized us, and therefore they, they are killing us like we're insignificant. And so that's not the first time that that's happened. And we are still feeling the impact today of the gospel advocate uh, being disseminated in our churches and as ironically we as Willie Lynch said we're always fighting we're always arguing the, the field Negroes hate the house Negroes and it's always always something going on where we can't get along with each other and I believe that it was part of that indoctrination that took part that was put on by the gospel advocate so to me, you, you know, what do you do? First of all, you realize evil where it is for what it is. And then, then when you take those thoughts captive, we've got the answer, right? The, the, the answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is the gospel of Christ. The answer is we need to live the way that Jesus lived. And Jesus came offering forgiveness. Jesus came offering reconciliation. Jesus came offering mercy. And in doing all that, of course I have to understand that every human being is created in the image of God. Uh, it's interesting, you know. The first, pe step, pe the first step is admit that we're human. We, we, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you would, know, too, on that, Brother Keeble would often say, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he would, instead of just dealing with all of that at face value, he said, now, nah, you have to admit that I'm a creature. Yeah, I read that somewhere. I'm a creature. Yes, you got to yeah. give me that. And he still would hold pace with the audience. And I'm telling you, and he would get more money from them than anybody. <laughs> we'll have one more response by Dr. Robinson before okay. our next question. Just yeah, I think we have to be careful uh, not to intermingle personal views with political views and political maneuvering. Um, and, I, and, and, and as he said, you have to view people within the context of their times. You know, that's, that's all I would say. I would just add that brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, we're still grappling with the legacy of chattel enslavement in this country, whether we realize it or not. You know, yes, we elected, you know, our first black president, but we're still grappling. 
with the legacy of slavery. Having said that, you know, David Lipscomb is, is a fascinating person. In my estimation, I believe he's worthy of a really, really good, um, a thorough academic uh, biography. Here's a man born in 1831. He grew up, his, he says that his playmates were slaves. He, his mother died in an early age. He was literally nursed, nursed by a black woman. And on two different occasions after the Civil War, Lipscomb came to the defense of African Americans. In 1878, there was a black man in McKinney, Texas, who presented himself for membership uh, at the white congregation, but they rejected him. Lipscomb found out about it and published a lengthy article in the Gospel Advocate denouncing the fact that he said, in essence, you cannot reject a person of a different race and still be a child of God. That's the article that Arian Hogan is going to pick up on in 1963. He's going to republish that article in the Christian Echo to denounce racial segregation. So, and then in 1907, Lipscomb will come to the defense of Brother Elam and his wife who brought a little black girl to church. And the white members there in Middle Tennessee got upset. And Lipscomb came to the defense and Brother Elam said, this little girl is a child of God. You know, so even though he may have had his blind spots, and we all do, right? We have to give Brother Lipscomb some credit in that here is a man who went against the grain on those occasions. And I believe that it was uh, because of his experiences in the antebellum period, that is before the Civil War, with black people that helped him to see that Black people are human beings, even though, of course, the culture that he lived in said otherwise. And, of course, the, the college that bared his name and still bears his name uh, was guilty of uh, practicing racial discrimination. Okay. Before I uh, ask my question, I want to uh, just address the gospel advocate. I wrote a letter to them concerning um, the racial thing. What I have done in my life, and, and because of trusting God and doing his will, I do not allow people that I come in contact to make me another race. I've taken the word of God and said, and, and people say this, we're all just a human race. But when it comes to the body of Christ, when I go to what I call my light-skinned brothers and sisters, who I, I, when I go into the congregation, I let them know, to me, you're just my light-skinned brother. So I'm a darker skin, you're lighter skin, we're all one in Christ. So I don't allow them to call me another race. There is no, when God's word talks about his people, he talks about nations. And that's what I tell them. Look, God said he took Abraham, he's going to make a nation out of them. And we are a human race. And so that's how I have, have dealt with it you know, with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't, if you look at me as another, you will never see me as an equal. And, and, and that's just the way I deal with it. And if they try, even in my own family, my family say, well, you, you talk about white people, and you call them your light-skinned brothers and sisters. I say, yes, because that's what we are. We're only brothers and sisters. They're not white, they're not black, we're brothers and sisters. One may be lighter, one may be darker, whatever the case may be, but we're all one human race, and if we would allow one another to just respect us as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we will get better. Amen. I can't see who's speaking, um, but you're saying some profound things. But can you present the question because we want to make okay. sure we get the other okay. questions? The question Thank is um, Ephesians 5 19, when it says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual, spiritual songs, my study of that. Um, Again, studying the word of God. When I looked up Psalms and I said, well, Psalms, when they talk about Psalms, it's an instrument. And the other thing was, if uh, back in that day, if Paul was talking to me, I would see Psalms as using instruments or instruments being there. And you would have to tell me not to use one. Because if you look at the word, the meaning of Psalm, it is an instrument. The use of the word psalm has a variety of connotations. 
in one connotation, it can in fact refer to an Old Testament psalm. In some contexts, it can refer to a, 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 uh, a Christian written psalm. It just depends on the connotation in which you use it. One thing we know about the New Testament is that it makes an explicit statement in James 5, if any be merry, let him sing psalms. Yeah, right. So we, we make the assumption that historically the church engaged in singing these psalms, whereas we do not necessarily take a posture that they would have been playing. Uh, there is a woeful historical reality that within the context of the New Testament we do not see playing. Um, so you are doing good study that when you look at the word psalm, there, there are a variety of connotations, but when we look at the corpus of the New Testament, we see where James says, if any be merry, let him sing psalm. So we see singing psalm as a dominant practice, as the practice of the New Testament, and we don't, we don't necessarily see the definition of playing psalm as inculcated in, these, in the New Testament context. So as we, we look at it, it becomes pretty clear. But that's good study, though. You're asking a good question, um, but you find that word psalm in a variety of passages, Ephesians 5.19, James 5.13. Um, and, and so you just have to ask the bigger question. One of the things we don't do well, um, even those, who are, or those of us who stick with a cappella advocacy, we kind of look at a word and divorce it from the context. I believe the best way to define any word is to look at it contextually, to see what is the meaning being expressed based on its relationship to other words. So what we do find in Ephesians 5.19 without dealing with the historical context is speaking to yourselves in Psalms, hymns, spiritual song. Here's the other participle, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So in the context where you see speaking and singing and psalm, we're assuming that the psalm was sung. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that as well. Um, scholars who have looked at that quite naturally uh, in, and I would use historical context, have argued that while this word, especially in the Old Testament situation, uh, implied the playing of an instrument. In other words, uh, soloing is uh, implied plucking on an instrument. But in the New Testament, you know, linguist, linguist scholars are basically consistent that this word did, did not imply that in the context, simply because uh, the early church didn't do it. You know, so that's their argument. And uh, because uh, the early church didn't do it, then it cannot carry that meaning in the New Testament. Now, that, that reference was James 5.13. James 5.13, sister. Thank you. We have uh, several questions, so we're going to try to um, expedite and get in and get out. Yes. Actually, what's the name? My question. I know the next one. Brother Robinson actually answered my one of the questions that I was going to ask about the slavery, where our mindset is. But I also asked the this wisdom young lady if it was okay if I uh, say what I'm about to say right now. So if it's out of order, it's her fault. Um, <laughs> I want to commend you, 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 you men of God. You all are not fighting. You guys are listening to one another. That makes me, as a member, look back and be so proud of my brothers wow. in Christ. Because I've seen y'all fight so much. And for you guys to, brother Foster, for you to, for you to make that statement yeah. you made, that's courage. Because we know how wiz I grew up with you and brother, uh, all, all you brothers with the campaign for Christ under the leadership of brother Reginald Doolin. And to see you guys sit here on this panel, young, old, middle-aged, and not fighting and listening to one another, it means so much to me. And, and secondly, and secondly, the reason why I believe that this college is growing so is because our president yeah. is listening to yeah. some wisdom sitting next to him. I believe that. And so I just want us to, you guys, to know how I feel right now. I'm 
full of tears because to see y'all so together. It, it means a lot. I want to echo what you said um, and just show you how profound that is. Probably the most profound statement of the day is what you said. Um, uh, I was hesitant to be here, um, very hesitant for a variety of reasons. Um, but um, Brandon Mims had me have a conversation with Dr. Seamster who I've always respected so highly. But until you're willing to have conversation, you see what I call ghosts. You, you begin to assume what you think a person's stances are with you, because you didn't have the conversation. And I just got to a space where I've learned to be alone, and I'm okay with it. Um, but when Dr. Seamster asked me to be here, and when I understood what he was after, that he has his finger on the pulse of this brotherhood, um, that's the reason I got a plane ticket. Um, because of that young man, Brandon Mims, back there, and the integrity um, of the conversation that I had with um, Dr. Seamster. Um, and we had two good ones, along with some other people. But when I understood what the end game was, I'm here. Brother Foster was my professor. One of the greatest Church of Christ preachers um, is Dr. Foster. You look up Church of Christ preacher in the, bi in, the, in the dictionary, his face is right there. He's not going to make a statement without a text. I mean, that's just him. You know? it's, uh, um, but what's liberating for me is Brother Foster as an older preacher. For him to say, I was wrong on this. That's huge because it's that kind of honesty that will free the church when you can hear a seasoned preacher like this, that you know knows the Bible say, yeah, we had that wrong. That doesn't make him less, any less. It actually raises his value because it demonstrates his integrity. We have to know the difference between the infallibility of scripture does not mean the infallibility of our understanding. We can grow. And Brother Foster is somebody I highly respect. And when you made this statement, you're echoing what touched me when I heard him say that. Because part of what I have been on a crusade about, as much as it is misdefined, is scriptural integrity and freeing the church from traditions that have nothing to do with scripture. That's been the, the call. And to hear Brother Foster say that today meant the world to me. And to see that Dr. Seamster's vision um, is coming to pass in this spirit of this panel, I am just, I'm moved like you are. And I'm grateful that I did get that ticket to come here today. Man, we're going to go to our next questions. First of all, let me. God, I Many of you do when the time has I'm so grateful to see what happened. But my question. In the world that we live in today, secular music, as well as sacred music, if you're on television and you sing one note from somebody's song, 
you're going to get a bill. So now when people come on, they hum some melody because they don't feel the need to try to pay people for everything they've done. Historically, we as members of the church many times will buy a song book or a sermon book and we copy, make as many copies as we want of that person's work. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be cruel, I'm trying to be honest. But the reality is other people buy books. They don't buy one book, they buy 100. We buy one book and make hundreds of copies. The reality is if people are going to, if this is how they make their living, while we might applaud their talent, they're not going to be able to live doing what we say they should be doing. So I guess my real question is, where do we go from there? Because if in fact we are encouraging them to write, should not we at the same time endorse and support what they're doing financially? This may not be the place for that, but that is my question. Uh, Dr. Howie, I don't want you to bill me again because I made it successfully out of this school, but can you state your question um, for the panel and, um, as succinctly as possible? All right, the question is, how do we bridge the gap? Because we're talking about bridge over troubled waters. We need to be, how can we bridge the gap between what we feel people should be doing and at the same time, make sure that they can, in fact, live doing what we say should be done. I would simply say, if I, if I understand your question, Brother Howie, a laborer is worthy yeah, of his hire. I read that. You know, please, uh, somebody writes a song book, please buy the song. Don't copy the songs. I mean, it's, it's usually... Uh, some kind of a statement in the front of the book that copyrights, copyrighted it as illegal to do that. And I'll add to that point, if a person writes Sunday school books, I write for the 21st century Christian. My books are used coast to coast. Buy my books. Please don't make copies of my books. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> With that said, let's go to the next question. I thought that was good. <laughs> Buy my books, yes. Hey, Amen. I want to echo the, the sentiments of those I think that this is a panel and life, in, in fact. Um, in, in the spirit of Dr. Hayward's last statement, and also in the spirit of what Dr. Foster I think all of us have uh, a desire to see the church uh, unified. Fellowship be uh, the one fellowship consolidated around the idea of this one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We know what the challenges are today. My question is, uh, and I think I want to pose this to Dr. Foster, your testimony, your admittance today, based on your life, uh, is, is one that ought to echo throughout our brotherhood. In doing so, it would quell a lot of uh, the tension that we have between the, let me parse this correctly, the traditional church of Christ, the older church, the new emerging, whereby those who are coming to a better understanding uh, or enlightenment in terms of the scripture and in the spirit of what uh, Orpheus Haywood, uh, his mission is, object. How can uh, we gather together men like you because we respect voices and our 
It's not what you say, it's who's saying. How can we galvanize men like yourself that will lead in the effort to uh, mm. do just what you did today on matters where we have been wrong about? Uh, maybe we've taken some liberalities, or maybe we've been dogmatic on things that there shouldn't have been a dog. Uh, thank you so much for your question. I, I think that. Uh, this is a good start right here at Southwestern Christian College where we can have open communication, but it doesn't have to always come here. Uh, you know, in, when James, or uh, rather Paul was talking about uh, taking a brother uh, before the courts uh, rather than before the brethren, he raised that question and said, is there not a wise man among you? <laughs> Is, is, there, is there not a wise man among you? You know, when you look in your congregation and uh, uh, seek those men that are wise and full of wisdom that can call brethren together and uh, really open up where people could feel free to have open discussions about things. And I think we need to have more of that in our congregations, don't you all? Uh, where people can express themselves and ask questions and as the good sister said and gave us all a compliment and not be intimidated by asking the question and get uh, uh, an answer based on God's word and if it's in the matter of judgment and opinions then state that don't try to make a law where God didn't make one amen and so I think we can get really moving if you could do that. And that pivotal question that Paul asked there in 1 Corinthians 6, is there not a wise man among you? And if the questions pertain to the sisters, is there not a wise sister among you? Amen. I want to uh, just echo, just to show you he believes that. Um, maybe a couple of months ago, several months ago now, um, he, um, he said, hey, um, he called me because he had questions about maybe some things I've stated. But as Brother Foster just indicated, just to show you his integrity, it, he was tired of talking around me. And he finally just called me because people kept calling him. And he said, well, I was his professor. I'm going to call him. And we had a wonderful dialogue. And he asked his questions and I answered them. And we left with clarity. I think more of that should happen. Where you stop talking around something and you talk to the individuals because it decreases um, misconception. Um, and so I think if we could have more of these, but also more personal interaction, ask the question. I think we would find we'd get more clarity as opposed to you listening to 10 other people that's not the person to which you're talking about. And Brother Foster did it. So I bring that up to say he called me, and he can. Cause, and if he would have told me be quiet, I'd have, I'd have said I, I'm going to be quiet. Um, but he, he wanted to know, hey, what do you teach? And we left with great clarity. So I just wanted to use that as an example to undergird what he just said. I want to see how many um, questions we have in light of our time so we can make sure we get to everyone. So if you have a question, would you all please raise your hand at this time? Okay, great. Okay. Bible member student. <laughs> I went to David of 1967. Yeah, now, uh, Sister Mary Vaughn, I want all of you to know her. She uh, has a food distribution program uh, in, it, in and of herself that she would go around and, and even out of the town where she lived in, lives in and minister to people. I mean, she's actually practicing Matthew chapter 25. And this is a sister that stands out in the Church of Christ. Amen. Now, sister, since I've bragged on you. Do you still have a question for me? <laughs> but at any rate, I went to David in 1967 and back then we just knew what we were told. Like two, one was when we did get that right, like church. Yes, help me with that. We 
we would go to uh, Grand and White Pike on campus and was told, sit at it and I the floor. Okay. There were other things I won't go into, but a few weeks ago, we had a teacher at the East Side Park of Kabutter that said things are still happening at David Lipscomb that we're working on. Give me your name and your number. But my question is how can we help schools like David Lipscomb? to not to be in a position where last week or two, a minister is saying, we are still having some issues at David Lipscomb. And I'm thinking, what do we need to do as Church of Christ Christians so that won't be said? Um, I'm a professor at Lipscomb University and um, and for the last two years have had, have developed some close relationships with the president as well as with the Bible ministry uh, department. And you are correct. There are still mishaps that happen. But uh, what I would like to say is there are very candid conversations happening regarding uh, some of the history of Lipscomb University and they are very specific uh, agendas and programs that are done even now to address a history of racism. One of the things that I indicated to them that a good start whenever you are attempting to deal with malady is to, is to accept ownership. And what the school has done um, has been taking ownership of things that have been historical mishaps. Um, the president of the university is having a, is giving very tenacious agendas in regards to address, addressing ethnic uh, ethnic uh, disparity, and I can speak firsthand to the fact that I know there are very specific efforts being done to address that. Now that can be the agenda of the university. It doesn't mean every individual in the university is going to always practice according to that agenda. So you, you have to know it's a process of addressing. They have a very serious vision on that, but there are mishaps. There are things that, um, that happen that we have to own when it happens and know that I'm a very candid person that speaks very candidly to the president and I can speak that she's very tenacious in regards to fighting uh, ethnic disparity uh, at Lipscomb University. So just to know that's happening, but it won't be solved uh, overnight. There's going to be mishaps. Sometimes you can have a great vision and every individual present isn't for the vision. And you got to deal with that as it shows up. So just know we, we are trying our best to, to address that. I'm going to break my facilitator role and to also add to this that I, um, I think what we can see with our white Churches of Christ um, schools and universities is a push back to the conservative right. And so I know a lot of, I, I, I'm a professor of religion at Pepperdine, and I'm in conversation with folks from ACU, Lipscomb, Harding, Freed Hardman, and it's really interesting um, in the wake of 2020 and the, and, and the wake of the presidency of Donald Trump that a lot of our schools have really tended towards the right. And so there's really not a lot that we can do about them, but being here at Southwestern and investing in what we have in our HBCU that's something powerful that we can do. You might ask, well, why do you teach there? Because um, after leaving Southwestern, that's where I was, and there are black um, students who need, who need uh, black professors as well, right? And so I think we should be, um, understand that it's not just one institution, and all of this ties into the restoration history, that we are dealing with a very racist um, tradition, and it's embodied in their institutions, right? Um, um, we were, Terry and I were talking about, you know, the, the endowments that other schools had. And he said, well, well they should have gave that to Southwestern. Yeah, they should have, right? And so I think, um, and, and Dr. Winrow can attest to this teaching um, in the institutions and also yourself, but um, it's not just one person or one institution, but we really have to take a panoramic view of what's happening um, with white churches of Christ and white church universities and schools. I think we have one more question. Um, you all make me so proud to be a part of the Church of Christ, and you've answered so many questions. Uh, you're, you're, 
You're just wonderful. Um, I have always uh, believed that there is power in people denying their own um, uh, judgments for the sake of the church to not be hurt. Uh, speak about that because when I travel, I have to investigate congregations and that shouldn't be. If we want to be one, then we need to be one. And, I, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not thinking that everybody's going to come on board. I know that. But just speak to people denying themselves in order for us to look more like one. This has been such an incredible conversation. Can we give a round of applause for all of our scholars who are on the panel? Come on, y'all can do better than that. This is a whole semester. It's a worth of work, and we just really want to thank them for their honesty, their scholarship, and was stated. Um, this was not a Facebook fight, um, but this was what real scholarship and collaboration and uh, dialogue looks like. Um, at this time, I would like to invite uh, President Seamster uh, to give remarks as we make a transition from this session to the next. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tauber, and I want to just, just echo what Dr. Tauber just said. We want to thank uh, these panelists for uh, agreeing to come and participating in this conversation, this dialogue. I'm very glad, uh, Orpheus, you came. And I wanted you to come because I did not want what happened to me to happen to you. Amen. Uh, so when I was 25 years ago, uh, I was the one that was preaching at a very large church, Marcellus Avenue, and we over a thousand people and just everything was just going very well. And sometimes everybody doesn't like the fact that a young guy is having, enjoying kind of that kind of uh, I don't want to say success, but being that effective publicly. Um, but, and then people started attacking. They never talked to me, they talked about me. And what I did was I, I marginalized myself, which was not the best thing. And I didn't want you to do that. Um, when you feel like you're, when you're speaking the truth, don't run from it, kind of run to it. Everybody is not jealous of you. There are people that love you, that appreciate you, that are benefiting all over the fellowship from your scholarship, from your preaching. And there are a lot of young men and women that they, they you influence them. And so if we lose you, we lose them. And so uh, it wasn't just about you, but it was about the people that you lead and serve in Atlanta and throughout our fellowship. You've been on national platforms with the Crusade. You've been on this platform, Dallas, and other places. So it's about not, we can't afford to keep having, having brain drain where we marginalize our most gifted scholars and thinkers and preachers and leaders. We can't keep marginalizing and questioning their scholarship. Instead of talking about each other, let's talk to each other. And, having, and when we start talking to each other and stop talking about each other, we're going to find out that you're a good guy. That's what I found out. You're a good guy, and you, you feel the same way about me. But some people want to see us fight, you see. And while we are fighting, the kingdom of God is losing ground. We're losing ground. Souls are being lost. And our institutions are dying. 
And I want to do whatever I can as, as the president, as long as I'm president, and I have the health and strength to do it, and as long as you guys, um, you know, want me to do it, um, I want to do what's right. One day, I'm going to have to stand before God. And I want to make sure that I can, I can stand before God and say, God, yes, faults, spoilables, blindnesses, contradictions, idiosyncrasies, prognostications, misinterpretations. But God, I did my best. And I know you died because you knew that I couldn't do all of it. And so that's where, that's where you have the blood of Jesus making yeah. the difference. Mm. But I'm a preacher of the cross. And let me just say this. The brotherhood looks weak. Mm. Looks like it's fractured and shattered. Mm. Yeah. But do you know that Jesus at the cross was God at his weakest, mm. but he was still strong enough yes, to defeat Satan? Well, Southwestern Christian College and the Church of Christ all over the world, we may be at our weakest, yes, sir. but we still strong enough yeah, right, yeah. to defeat Satan. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dansby, and then I got to ease out. I got to run to the homecoming game because my babies now, I've been working with y'all all week now. I got to spend some time with my students, so they're going to be looking at me funny when y'all gone. They're going to say I'm two-faced, so I don't want to do that. Dr. Dansman, come on and say a word. Thank you, Doc. There you go. First, I want to say I really appreciate everyone on the panel. And I am thankful for the knowledge that you have shared with us. I wasn't fortunate to go to a Christian school. All of mine was Louisiana Tech places like that, but I know where I can get knowledge if I need it. But I do have some. I heard, I heard you say something about the songs. I heard somebody say something about slavery. I heard somebody say something about the gospel advocate. So let me tell you something. If you would help us get $20,000, we could publish the Christian Echo tomorrow. <laughs> and if you would go back to your congregations as we used to have, a sister who would solicit subscriptions to the Christian Echo where it could keep on going as Brother Hogan and Sister Bethel Smith had it going, we could publish it. But we can talk all we want to about the Christian Echo uh, and all of those, but they got money to publish. And as I heard one man say, Tarzan always wins in the jungle until an alligator learns how to read. <laughs> Second thing that I want to address quickly is that we always buy books at Russell Road Church of Christ, yours and Sylvia Rose's. We buy them for the whole congregation. And then we have a license. We buy a license where we can put it up on the screen. You know they sell license for that, right? Okay, but we will buy the big book from the Gospel Advocate, 20th Century Christian, and we will make copies of all of Silver Rose's work. And if you've been around congregations like I have, you see them in little books, handmade books. Okay? Uh, and that's discouraging to the person who did that. So they're still in print. If you're copying them, go back and buy Sylvia Rose's books. Holy Spirit, he mentioned that. Oh, I like those books. Last thing uh, is slavery. 
We are far removed from slavery. I had some ancestors who were slaves, but I'm not. Problem with us is, many of us still have slave man mentality. Slave man mentality dictates that you can't follow the leadership of President Seamster or these ministers up because you still have slave man mentality and they taught you that you could not follow the direction of another person who was the same complexion as you are. <laughs> you see, I'm going on back to Shreveport after a while and I'm not dependent on. So I'm just telling you the truth as I, as I see it. And if we support each other, we can all be one once again. Amen. Support all these men up here, Dr. Seems to all our preachers out there. We can be one as Christ and the Father is one that the world might know who we are. God bless you. I love you. And you can't do nothing about that. If you don't love me, that's all right, too. I'll see you later. God bless all of you. Can we all stand, please? We're going to ask Brother Pew to lead us in a verse of a song. And uh, you can designate someone, Brother Pew, uh, to close us out if you, you want to close us out. Thank you so much, my friend. Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Touch my eyes that I might see all your goodness, grace, and power. Oh, stay beside me every hour. Be my drink, be my living bread. Yes, keep me sheltered. Keep me fed, oh, Holy Spirit, oh, Holy Spirit, dwell in me. Let us bow. Father God, we thank you and we honor you uh, right now. God, we thank you for this moment we were able to spend together discussing things surrounding your kingdom, discussing uh, things historically and socially and uh, spiritually, God, that we all need. And we thank you for each and every one of these great men on this panel. We thank you for our facilitator, God. We thank you for our president and for his vision uh, for Southwestern. And we thank you for the board, faculty, and staff. We thank you for all that you have done. And we ask that as we prepare to leave this place, that you would just guide us, that we would lean upon you for every single thing. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage everybody to be back at 7. Please feel free to visit our vendors and the bookstore. Thank you. Watch it still be.